Well, hello there. It's good to be with you. Thank you for inviting me into your places and spaces. And um, hey, it's, um, well, it's Saturday and tomorrow is March the 26th, the last Sunday of March. And we are closer and closer to Easter week in April. And I hope uh, you've been able to spend some time over the last at least a week or so, maybe in a couple of days, or just recently to prepare yourself for uh, uh, that celebration of the resurrection. Uh, beginning with uh, the next couple of Sundays, um, I will be uh, pressing pause on this sermon series, Galatians for Freedom, and you can find um, that I will be putting together a couple of messages, one for Palm Sunday and one for Good Friday and one for Easter Sunday as well. And I will, um, I will definitely uh, post those on the YouTube channel and on Facebook, and you'll find them on our, face, on our webpage as well, Redwater Alliance. You'll find all those in there somewhere. So I just want to just get right into it this morning because we've come really to a juncture in Paul's letter in Galatians here. As we look back a little bit at the beginning of Paul's letter, we, we see that Paul had emphasized the, the clear-cut clear-cut difference between what he called the works of the law and faith in Jesus Christ. For example, in chapter 2, verse 16, Paul said uh, this, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. In the very same breath, same verse, uh, Paul said, faith in Jesus Christ was needed in order to be justified. So to the point, no one is justified before a holy and just God by works. No one is justified by works. Only one can be justified before a holy and just God by believing in Jesus Christ. And as we've seen in this, in, in this journey through this letter, that this was the crux of the division that was occurring in the Galatian churches. Paul had preached his gospel of a crucified and risen Christ. That's the gospel. And the Galatians had received and believed that gospel. They had been redeemed and had been adopted by God. They had become sons and daughters of God. Yet some had come to believe, as we've seen here in this letter, another gospel, which Paul had put it quite clearly in chapter 1, was no gospel at all. It was a false gospel of works, self-righteousness. We have seen Paul's heart and determination to correct an incorrect use of the Bible by the false teachers to win over the Galatians, because they would have used the Old Testament for their argument. We have seen Paul's zealous opposition to anything or anyone who would undermine the gospel, whether it was right up in the face of a fellow apostle, calling them out publicly, or directly to the false teachers through this letter, bringing on them the very curse of God himself. And uh, we moved into chapter 5 last week. Uh, we see Paul speaking of circumcision, and there he outright demolished any notion of gaining an advantage through circumcision in regards to salvation. And for any Galatian to consider otherwise, Paul was more than clear when he said, you have fallen from grace. Chapter 5, verse 4. For Paul had reminded the Galatians, as he's reminded us, that it was for freedom that Christ had set them free. Verse 1 of chapter 5. And then he exhorted them to stand firm in their freedom in Christ and not to submit themselves to what he called a yoke of slavery. And uh, as we bring this to today, we see that Paul was confident that the Galatians would come to their senses despite the obvious divisions among them. So it's here that we find that juncture in the road or, or in, in, the, in the letter that was just stated a minute ago. Paul reminded here, reminded it as we will look at this text, that the Galatians, uh, that behind a Christian, that to the Galatians and to us, boy, I really got that mess. Let me start over, back up. Paul reminded the Galatians, as he reminds us, that behind a Christian's freedom in Christ is his spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, and that's what we don't want to miss today. So please turn your Bibles to chapter 5, and we'll pick up where we left off last week. Uh, we'll start at verse 16, and we'll go to the end of the chapter. Verse 16 of chapter 5. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, 
and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying, envying one another. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh Lord, by your spirit that you will instruct us, and not only instruct us, that you will also reveal to us those places in our lives that we need to surrender to you, maybe even ask for forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to that that uh, calling from you. And I pray, God, also as we learn a few things about our flesh and a few things about the fruit of the Spirit today, that you would help us not only remember them in the days to come, but also to uh, work those out into our own lives. And Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to be uh, together. We ask your blessing on us and help us to understand these things for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So right here at the beginning, uh, it will become apparent uh, sooner or later that our study will not afford us the time nor space to mine the depths of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit as revealed in the Bible. And thus our doctrinal statement will need to suffice for today as a foundational biblical statement concerning a third person of the Trinity, that is the Holy Spirit. So borrowing from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, we affirm there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. The second point that would be beneficial for us to sort out here at the beginning is a point of clarification. As you may have seen, as you, be, as you read with me through the scripture, you will find the word flesh uh, here in this text three times from verse 16 to 18. So we ask the question, how are we to understand this word flesh? So applying the kiss principle, when Paul uses the word flesh, simply and clearly is not pointing to our flesh and blood bodies. So to clarify, Paul, when using flesh, is speaking of our intrinsic weakness and mortality, which is called our human nature. Or as one commentator put it, quote, means the best and the worst anyone can do in themselves. Or as another commentator put it, quote, all the evil that humanity is and is capable apart from the intervention of God's grace in life. So I'm not sure how helpful this was for you, but my hope is that you will come to understand as we move into this text, as we see Paul apply this here in the text. So without further delay, read with me again verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We remember, friends, that the Galatians had entered a time of division as some had began to buy into the false teaching that was being presented. Matter of fact, if you look at the previous verse, verse 16, Paul was concerned here that some might even bite and devour one another over this issue. Paul there using a cannibalistic metaphor to emphasize the danger that Galatians were facing. So Paul instead of said, instead of consuming one another, thereby gratifying the desires of flesh, that we see here in verse 16, he said, walk in the Spirit. As we look at verse 16, please notice the word walk. The 1986 NIV translation uses the word live. So do some others. 
He uses the word live, vice walk. Robert Mouts and his reverse interlinear liner. Uh, New Testament also translate the Greek as live. It's important to note as well that this verb is in the imperative mood, so it's a command. And it is in the active voice, which means the doer, uh, the subject, as a doer of the action. The subject as a doer of the action. Something like this. Tony returned to Jasper. So Tony performs the action. Well, now that I messed with your grammar skills, here's the point. And remember, this is a command. Live every day in the power of the Holy Spirit. Live every day in the power of the Holy Spirit. The moment you wake up until you put your head down on your pillow, live by the Spirit. Or as verse 25 tells us, keep in step with the Spirit. So we just begun with one verse, and already we, we see a contrast here that Paul provides. Remember, you and I have our human nature to deal with every day. That's the flesh. Remember, Paul when talks about the flesh. It's not about our blood and flesh. He's talking about our human nature. That's what he's addressing here. And the flesh has absolutely nothing, as someone said, quote, in common with God's power. Paul put it this way in his second letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 and 17. Paul said, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So I just want to ask you a question, and I want you to take this personally. Are you a person of the Spirit? Do you live by the Spirit? Are you led by the Spirit? Do you keep in step with the Spirit? Or, on the other hand, are you a person of the flesh? You run your life. You are the captain of your ship. You depend on yourself only. And Paul would say, as he said to the Roman church, for the mind that is set on the flesh is a hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. And in the very next, next verse, verse 9, Paul would go on to say, you, however, you, however, those are the Christians in Rome, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. So this brings up another question. Do you, do I, have the spirit of God dwelling in us? Let's go back to chapter 3, see if we can find an answer to this. Chapter 3 of Galatians, that is. There Paul said in verse 2 and 3, let me ask you only this, speaking to the Galatians, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing by faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you, are you being perfected by the flesh? Let's move to chapter 4, verse 6. There Paul, there Paul said this, God sent, it, sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. So do you, do I, have the Spirit of God dwelling in you? And do you live by that same Spirit? Well, moving along, we go to verse 17, and there we have a uh, great description of a spiritual reality that we would be wise to learn and understand. Now, we've already addressed some of this for the most part, as you look at verse 17 on your own there. But I do want to highlight this that on this side of heaven, the desires of our flesh will continually oppose the desires of the Spirit and vice versa. Continually is a key word there. And I think Paul understood this to a great depth, maybe more than we will ever understand, when he said to, when he said to the Romans in his letter, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Romans 7, 24. And then he just followed that up with his own answer in verse 25. 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's the point, folks. As you wake up in the morning and begin your day, and you seek to keep in the step with the Spirit, your human nature, the desires of your flesh, will continually oppose the desires of the Spirit. Every day. Moving into verse 18, it just repeats what verse 16 really said, but it, now it mentions the law. But I do want us to notice together the beginning of this verse, this phrase, but if you are led by the Spirit. And Paul here is reaching back to the relationship that Israel had with God. And we know as we look through the Old Testament, throughout Israel's history, we find those statements and those events that clearly reveal that Israel was led by God. For example, he would go up ahead of them in battle, basically do the work and they would just clean up, stuff like that. We turn to Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 31 and there we find him doing what the Old Testament prophets did. He prophesied and he prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31 and 34 that God would make a new covenant with Israel. And of course, he's pointing to Jesus and that new covenant. What's interesting is what he said about this new covenant. That it would not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day. Jesus, God speaking through the prophet, I took them by their hand out of the hand of Egypt. God led Israel with that metaphor of the hand. Now God leads his people by his Holy Spirit that indwells his people. Now we finally arrived at verse 19 to 21. And I, I just want to keep it kind of brief here. I just want to make a few statements of a, an advisory nature. We see here in verse 19 that Paul presents us with 15 vices, or as he called, the works of the flesh. And uh, I want you to think about this. when, Because there's this possibility that when you and I encounter a list like Paul, it brings us to think of other persons we may have heard of or even know who are engaged in some of these vices today. And I don't want you to do that. I want you to keep this in the framework of your own life. Because one of the negative hindrances of comparison that we all face in our lives is that when we look through a list like the one we have before us, we turn our thoughts outward, or we might say something like this, I have never cheated on my spouse, or I, I gave up drinking a long time ago, or you might make reference to Billy Bob, who is always angry. Uh, let's not do that, let's keep it within the framework of your own life. One last advisory, in our willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit, we should not drop our guard. Remember, Paul had already said that this list is not all-inclusive. We look at toward the end of uh, this list, he says, and things like this. This is not a comprehensive list of the works of the flesh. My friends, no one believer is immune from temptation. We would be wise to listen to the wisdom and heed the words of King Solomon when he said, keep your heart with all vigilance. For from it flow the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23 Well, having said this, the, the more important piece is what Paul said in summary after giving us this list of vices. He said this, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here, Paul was addressing those who habitually sin, not those who have this an isolated moral failure or uh, isolated sin. You see, Paul understood the difference between the person who, according to verse 24, belonged to Christ Jesus and has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires and the person who, habitu who has a habit of sin. The first has had their old self, their old self, their old nature, crucified with Christ, so they will no longer be enslaved to sin, Romans 6.6. 6. The other is what Jesus said about that person. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, John 8.34. They are slaves to sin. They are slaves to sin. 
So here's the deal. Biblically, a believer has been brought into union with Christ. The Bible teaches us that. And one result among many in, this, in the believer's union with Christ is that Christ by his spirit takes up residence in the believer. And every genuine believer has the living presence, the indwelling presence of God, the Holy Spirit, inside of them. They have, as one commentator put it so well, quote, a new moral ability, an ability to reflect God's very own character. Sin no longer has the power over those who are united to Christ and their desires now turn Godward. And as we move into verse 22, we see this Godward desire, this Godward attitude as we look at the fruit of the Spirit. And please notice with me the very first characteristic of what Paul called the fruit of the Spirit. And notice it's fruit, not fruits. And notice it is of the Spirit, not of me or you. It's of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The very first characteristic of what Paul called the fruit of the Spirit is love. We can turn to the Apostle John in his first letter for some commentary where he said this, that God is love. And that those who are his children according to John, love one another, 1 John 4, 7. And this would, should cause us to take a quick glance in our rearview mirror at verse 19 to see that this kind of love for one another is the opposite of strife, jealousy, and so forth. Because indeed, these are those things that are opposed to each other. The love of God has nothing to do with strife and jealousy. And I think John goes further when he said about those who do not love or do not have the love of God, maybe. The person who does not love, John said, does not know God. Why? Because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. Now, to be fair, in order to really get a full, a meaningful understanding of what John meant here is to do a deep dive in, in the Greek meaning of love, because in many ways, the English language hinders us. And I, and I, and I appeal to John Stott, to help, John Stott in his commentary to help us. Because I like the way he summarizes the first three virtues that we see here in, in verse 22. Love, joy, and peace. And he puts it this way. Because it always goes back to our attitude, our desires toward God. Our Godward attitude, if you will. You and I love God. And in that love relationship with God, we then find enduring joy, which brings true and lasting peace into our lives. And considering that, we could do the same for each of these virtues in verse 22. That our desire, our Godward attitude as, uh, toward God, our attitude toward God, I mean, as we are led by the Holy Spirit, produces these spiritual virtues. We behave as the Spirit of God leads us on in these kinds of virtues. In other words, we demonstrate by our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, our new nature in Christ. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This new nature in Christ is, as Paul put it in his letter to the Ephesians, when you think of the culture that we live in, is in opposition to the unfruitful works of darkness, and we've just found a small sample here of the unfruitful works of darkness in verse 17. Well, friends, I just want to bring this really close to home. I had to ask you to keep what Paul was teaching about the works of the flesh close to your own vest. You know those vices that we find here in this text. I also hope you've been able to understand in the brief time that we looked at the fruit of the Spirit, that you, have some, that you have some decisions to make every day that you wake up. Because after all, the Christian life is lived in reality. The reality of a dark and sinful world, contrary to what the culture tells us. Yet despite the opposition from around us and from within us, that is our human natures, God pours out his grace upon us daily. Think about that. Of course, life can be difficult in any given day, 
One of the things that really drives me up the wall, and I just want to be quite honest and, and frank with you, is those Christians who say that God will not allow any sickness or poverty or harm to come into the life of a Christian. Poppycock. I just wonder if they've actually read their Bibles. And, and if they have, I, I'm sure they might be tempted to twist it because I think that's what they've done. Because this kind of false teaching falls far short of reality and often does lasting harm to one's faith in God. There's another stumbling block that is very apparent here in the 21st century, especially with all our modern conveniences, our technologies, etc., and, and, and many other things, is the constant focus on tomorrow. Constant focus on two years from now and five years from now and what I'm going to do when I'm 50 and 60 and all that stuff. And I think it's easy to rationalize because one could be a fool to be ill-prepared for tomorrow because there's some truth in that. However, the last time I checked in the Bible, I don't see anywhere where tomorrow is promised on this earth. You might disagree with me, but I still wouldn't be convinced. But let me ask you, do you know what is promised? That no matter what circumstance or situation that you and I will find ourselves in today, and yes, if God grants us tomorrow, even then, God is with you and me. And it's amazing, because sometimes God decides to give us a wow kind of experience. And he demonstrates the power of his Holy Spirit for example, he heals our sicknesses. He even moves mountains, to use the metaphor, for us in these wondrous ways. But I think that's not the norm. Because if we would pay attention to the now moments, and even the more difficult moments in our now times, God reveals himself in the midst of our tears and sorrow and pain. Because, friends, after all, there is no pain, no sorrow, no tear that God has not fully experienced through Christ. The very one who made all the things, made all things, keeps all things for his own pleasure, is with you and me every day, always, forever. And one day, this is the promise, this is the hope this very same amazing, lovely God that we serve will take away all our pain, and all our sorrows, and all our tears forever and ever. Amen. Well, I want to I wanna end uh, by sharing um, a stanza, and I want to use it in a form of a prayer from a song called Sometimes by Step. Yeah, sometimes in the, somewhere in the 90s, I can't remember exactly what year of the 90s, uh, this song, Sometimes by Step, won the GMA Dove Awards Song of the Year. I remember it from singer-songwriter Rich Mullins, Christian singer, singer and songwriter Rich Mullins, who tragically died, I think it's 1997, in a car accident. And I heard it uh, in my early formation as a Christian, and it was just a wonderful song, and I want to conclude uh, our time together and use it as a prayer. So please join me as we pray together. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you, and I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your ways, and step by step you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. Amen. Thank you so much for inviting me in your homes. Uh, the next time we meet, uh, probably would be Palm Sunday. So bring your palms and let's wave them in the air. Thank you again. God bless. Shalom.